Happy Halloween, Crumbums! It's time for another spooky episode of Canonically Crumb, the only show that exhumes the comics and characters of the Crummyverse. In 1935, the not-yet-reviled Dr. Frederick Wortham testified in defense of notorious sadosexual child-murdering cannibal Albert Fish. Wortham's assessment? Fish was totally insane and unfit for the death penalty. Two decades later, in 1948, Dr. Wortham first reported on the findings of his study of juvenile delinquency and crime in Collier's magazine. It was a highly sensationalized article titled Horror in the Nursery, and it helped to kick off the moral panic over comics that gripped America in the early 1950s. In 1954, he published his now infamous book, Seduction of the Innocent. That same year, there were a series of Senate subcommittee hearings into juvenile delinquency with a special focus on comic books. And I mean, Wortham wasn't entirely wrong. Many of the more lurid comics of the time were not appropriate for young children, and they were being marketed to them in the sleaziest possible ways. But Wortham's methods were as dubious as his claims, like his obsession with hidden butts everywhere. Or are those supposed to be boobs? A bush? Only Wortham can tell. And much like Hollywood had done with the Hayes Code 20 years earlier, comic book publishers self-imposed a rigid set of guidelines in 1954 in hopes of avoiding government-imposed regulation. Shortly after, only comic books that carried the seal of Amon, I, I mean, the seal of the Comics Code Authority, were able to be sold on newsstands. And comic books officially became lame. But my mom says I'm cool. In the post-war period, due in part to an unspoken popularity of comics amongst adults, a wide variety of comic book genres had proliferated in the market. Everything from westerns to atomic war and jungle girls and anything else that you can imagine. But following the implementation of the Comics Code Authority, Variety began to dwindle, and soon the market consisted mainly of kids' comics, like superheroes and Archie. Some genres, like crime and horror, were virtually eliminated overnight. <laughs> but when Robert Crumb, alongside other cartoonists, started the underground comics movement in the late 1960s, instead of on newsstands, they sold their books at head shops and record stores, and so they were able to publish outside of the Comics Code Authority. And it turns out that many of these underground cartoonists had been influenced by the pre-code comics of their early childhood, and they appropriated the look and feel of them for their own work. War, weird fiction, Satire, jungle, sci-fi, funny animals, romance, crime, and the genre that we're talking about today, horror. Specifically, we'll be looking at a comic book from 1971 called Thrilling Murder Comics, subtitle Thrilling Tales of Total Paranoia. It was published by Gary Arlington's San Francisco Comic Book Company and edited by Simon Deitch, who also did the cover. Inside it featured, along with other artists, a four-page comic by R. Crumb called Jumpin' Jack Flash. As always, we need to acknowledge that for our nefarious purposes, Robert Crumb's canon includes The Big Yum Yum Book, The Complete Crumb, The Weirdo Years, Zap, Hop, Mystic Funnies, and a bit of Dirty Laundry. As well today, I need to mention that the original printing of Thrilling Murder Comics had this gimmick of including uh, red ink wherever there was uh, blood in the comics. Since I'm using the uh, reprinted versions from the Complete Crumb Volume 8, uh, it doesn't include uh, the blood in that printing. So I've added the red to the blood myself digitally. So, you're welcome. Published in 1971, Jumpin' Jack Flash begins with the narration, He's here, he's here! After 1970 years of blasphemy against Christ, 
all the shame, all the guilt. They can't hide it any longer. It's the second coming. It's Jumpin' Jack Flash. At the bottom of the page are some of Jack's girls who say, Jack Flash is God. Jack Flash is love. He's a gas, gas, gas. Jack has a long, flowing mane of hair and intense, square eyes that occupy a full third of his face. They actually round the sides of his head. We see this square-eyed stereotype other places in the Crummyverse, too, often associated with drugs, especially speed, and it represents a sort of dark, scummy kind of irritating personality that should be avoided at all costs. He stares directly at the reader and says, I am Jack, and Jack is me. All are one. You are me. You are Jack. Cease to exist. Kill the ego. Become nothing. Become me. Cut to an urban park where Jack sits cross-legged on the grass with a young woman wearing a miniskirt. He's giving her basically the same spiel he just gave us on the first page. He tells her that he's the messiah and that ego is the devil. And if she can kill the devil, she can become one with him, which would make her the Messiah as well. This is all very mind-blowing for her, and she babbles incoherently as she reaches an egoless state of submission to the mindless cosmos. Jack takes this opportunity to stand up and defecate directly on her face with a splop. He tells her that his shit tasteth like roses, and to eat it. Now. I don't think roses are really uh, that particularly popular of a thing to eat either, but uh, she accepts it with a muffled, oh wow. Afterward, she says, disgustingly, mmm, that was good. I am you, I am love, you. And she, she kind of trails off. To which Jack, who is very short for a dude, replies, excellent. You'll do fine, my love, just fine. This particular coprophagic scene is fairly shocking and one of the more extreme sexual acts within the entire canon. But, of course, I don't know how this was received in 1971. Uh, it's hard not to view this nowadays, except through a, you know, lens of a world where uh, two girls, one cup reaction videos are a thing. And um, maybe it seemed more uh, absurd and humorous at the time, and less uh, sad and upsetting. She continues to babble as Jumpin' Jack Flash escorts her over to another group of women. He says, Come, you are now one of the family. The girls have his dinner ready, and one is even nude on all fours, wagging her ass in the air. Thrilled, she exclaims, I get to be the throne today. Later, sitting atop his throne, who seems very content with her situation in life, actually, Jack declares that it's time to feed one of his girls as an act of submission and Christian humility. Sunshine is chosen, and the other girls appear envious because Sunshine gets to taste the very essence of life force. The moment is approaching, and Jack assures Sunshine that it shall be the greatest moment of her life, the moment of self-realization. And he rhythmically chants, in, out, in, out, everything in life is in, out. Reaching climax, Jack hands this girl, Gichi, a large buck knife, which he normally keeps in an ankle sheath, as we can see from his appearance on the wraparound cover of another Gary Arlington imprint from 1971, San Francisco comic book, number three. He tells Geechee that she can do the honors, uh, but apparently the honors are to murder Sunshine by stabbing her in the back at the moment she reaches orgasm. Which she does, and she does. Geechee calls it a beautiful experience repeating Jack's line that everything in life is in out, which she demonstrates by plunging the knife in and out of Sunshine's lifeless corpse. Jack tells the girls that they've witnessed a moment of truth and that Sunshine is now in the highest of all states of being, non-being. He goes on to say that she gave up and only total submission brings total bliss. Another girl, inspired, shouts, I want to do it too stabbing Geechee with a knife. And with a wee, yet another girl kills her. 
and Jack cheers him on, saying, Unless you're willing to die for your love, you cannot love. And death is life, life is love, and love is death. And we're treated to yet another classic crumb, Pile O' Girls. In the final panel, a smiling Jumpin' Jack Flash with Radiant Emanata speaks directly to the reader. He says, I am you. Anything you see in me is you. When you can admit that, you'll be free. I'm just a mirror. And we know that he's serious because he tells us this from atop of a mountain of dead girls that he's fucking. The panel is arranged a bit like the Masonic Square and Compass. Uh, make of that what you will. And the final ending to Jumpin' Jack Flash is a narration box that reads, which proves once again that women are no goddamn good. What the hell was that? <sighs> okay, <laughs> let's unpack this a bit. Now, I want to avoid giving Jumpin' Jack Flash a purely libidinal reading, uh, which is admittedly charitable on my part because this comic does feature a lot of Crumb's uh, favorite recurring sexual imagery and themes throughout. From objectifying a woman's ass as a chair, to the blowjob, to the fecophilia and the necrophilia, and even the pile o' girls. And Crumb even later drew himself in almost the exact pose as Jack Flash in one of his most explicitly self-indulgent comics, If I Were a King, from 1987. But this comic is also very clearly referencing the cult leader Charles Manson and his Manson family, who were responsible for killing nine people, including a famous person, in July and August of 1969. And this is made even more clear in his sketchbooks from 1970, where, in developing the character, he uses an earlier concept title, uh, Charlie Manson Comics, The Man Who Shit Doesn't Stink. There's also an early sketch for the San Francisco Comics comic book cover on the facing page. Jack Flash is clearly modeled on Manson. The hair, the face, the clothes. He's even short like Manson. Not surprisingly, Crumb draws some of the Manson girls in his sketchbooks as well, including Susan Atkins, who appears in this advertisement for Thrilling Murder Comics with her real name. And I'm pretty sure she's supposed to be the body Jack is fucking in the last panel. I found some other places where the girls in the comic might be modeled after uh, other Manson girls as well. Here's some of my best guesses. Patty Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Linda Kasabian, Susan Atkins, again, Squeaky Fromm, and I think Geechee could be uh, Catherine Gypsy Cher. You know, Geechee, Gypsy, she kind of looks a bit like her. And I think this girl with the braids has got to be from some photo somewhere. You know, I, did, I didn't find the photo, but, you know, she doesn't seem like she's just made up on the spot, you know? Jack speaks in the same kind of quasi-holy aphorisms that Charlie talks with. Every day, every reality is a new reality. You know what you are as I know what I am. We all know what we are. Nobody can stand in judgment. They can play like they're standing in judgment. They can play like they stand in judgment and take you off and control the masses with your human body, but it doesn't amount to anything. What they're doing is they're only persecuting a reflection of themselves. They're persecuting what they can't stand to look at in themselves, the truth. And the New Age philosophy, largely borrowed from Scientology in the process church, is just duality. You and me and life and death and ass and mouth. You know, that kind of hippie bullshit. With a little bit of messianic Christianity thrown in. Yeah, there he is, God. And that's why they're hanging him. That's why they're killing him. And of course, a conspicuous uh, cult-like devotion and service to the leader, especially from the women. As long as they keep their mouth shut and do what they're supposed to do. Why do you say that? because that's what a woman's supposed to do. So Crumb isn't exaggerating from the source much with the worldview that Jack Flash presents. And the substance of the portrayal, a rock star hippie guru easily blowing the minds of drug-addled young chicks with new age babble, seducing them into deviant sex, alternative lifestyles and exploitation, all ending in murder, is accurate. 
and even the part where Geechee stabs, stabs, stabs Sunshine repeatedly seems eerily similar to Leslie Van Houten's testimony about stabbing Rosemary LaBianca over and over again. I quote, I was obsessed with the knife. Once it went in, it just kept going in and in and in. And I don't think that they're evil or anything like that, uh, Manson included. They're all just products of their environment who were profoundly stupid, shitty people who were also tripping balls. I am Charlie. And if he dies, I die. You said you are Charlie? I gave up my personality and become what he showed me I can be. And that is what? Total love. But I think Crumb is a little unfair to the women in this comic, even more so than all the rest of his comics. And yes, I know that some of these women were literally murderers. But the Manson family wasn't all women. You know, it's just that the women were kept up front, both by Manson and the media, as a marketing gimmick. You know, Manson used them to lure in new members and uh, to pimp and trade. And the media portrayed the girls on trial as avatars of lost innocence, corrupted by uh, the degenerate, uh, charismatic cult leader, while outside the courts, the loyal Manson girls created a spectacle for the cameras, shaving their heads and carving X's between their eyes. But there's also a lot of men in the Manson family, including Tex Watson, who actually did a lot of the crimes and murdering. So when Crumb ends this comic with, which proves once again, women are no goddamn good, it feels like he's blaming only the women. But I have to remind myself that Jumpin' Jack Flash himself is not meant to come across as cool or good. He's a psychopathic, murderous necrophiliac, and I think we're supposed to take it as given that Jack is worse than the women who are murderers. Crumb was very cynical about rock star guru types. They're always portrayed in the crummy verses, opportunistic phonies preying on naive, uh, drugged up hippie chicks. I wonder if the whole Manson family murders were uh, somewhat vindicating for Crumb in a, you know, in a dark sort of way. He was very critical of the excesses of the hippies and he often highlighted the more sinister elements of the movement, which seemed to be festering. The Manson family murders are one of two events often cited as sort of the symbolic end to the 1960s. The other being the stabbing murder at the Altamount Free Concert during the Rolling Stones set by a Hells Angels member where the gang was hired to be security. To be fair though, these events took place during 1969, so, uh, you know, the 60s were gonna end anyway. Charles Manson is associated with the Beatles song, Helter Skelter, since the words were written in blood on the walls at one of the murder scenes. But Crumb chooses to name his Charles Manson-based character after a Rolling Stones song, uh, Jumpin' Jack Flash. And he even references the line, it's a gas, gas, gas. You know, in part, it's because the Rolling Stones are, you know, the other band in relationship to the Beatles if you know what I mean. But by naming the character Jumping Jack Flash, some of the stink of the disrespect that he's apportioning to Charles Manson and the Manson girls is getting onto the Stones and their girls, you know, their fans, who he doesn't really think very much of either. And I think he was probably a little jealous of the rock stars like the Stones and maybe even Manson a bit, you know, for their ease at attracting women. But I think one of the interesting things about Crumb's art is that he treats it as a space where he can explore uh, difficult personal issues and taboos, uh, you know, without any restraint. He doesn't hold back. And, you know, a lot of it is ugly. Uh, and it's not for everybody. But I have to admit, it's refreshing that Crumb can still make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, after all the time I've spent with his work. Uh, but it does make me wonder to what degree I'm, I'm uncomfortable because I'm a product of my own environment. Uh, you know, one so different from the audience that would have been reading thrilling murder comics in 1971. 
Manson was only convicted in January of that year. Putting Manson, uh, ostensibly Manson, on the cover of a comic book would have been fairly transgressive at the time. And I mean, you know, he's not the only one doing it either. But nowadays, and you know, especially because he died a few years ago, Manson isn't really uh, a credible boogeyman anymore. He's just another pop culture figure, uh, a meme, if you will. So perhaps Crumbums, the real monster, is time. Because we're out of time for this episode! Happy Halloween! If you enjoyed this program, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, be a ding dong daddy, and ding that bell. I've been your host, Kyle Bridget. You can find my links in the show description and join me in the Nostril Zone, where we listen to tunes and draw cartoons every Sunday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Central Time. And if you want to support this program and myself, you will also find my Patreon in the show description as well. Canonically Crumb will be back as weekly as possible with another deep dive into the Crummyverse. Thanks again, Crumb Bums, and keep on onin'. I've got the heebie-jeebies. What you doing with the jeebies? Said I got those heebies. Got those heebies. The heebies.